I know this just because I know baseball, but you literally threw one of the games of your life. You know, but baseball's 27 outs. Um, uh, you went over eight innings and just did your thing. Well, we started, Steve Rogers pitched us into the league championship series, beating Steve Carlton twice in the, in the divisional Amazing. series. We played the first game in Los Angeles. Bill Gullickson was pitching the first game against uh, uh, Forster. Uh, not Forster, uh, Jerry Royce. Sure. We lose that first game. Okay. Now I'm scheduled to win, pitch the second game in Los Angeles. Right. Because it's a two-three-two series. I'm in the Biltmore Hotel in downtown LA, watching NBC Sports. Right. And they've got the lineup of the Dodgers. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know and where they this is they go down. They go down the lineup and they say everybody's name on the lineup, including the pitcher which was Fernando Valenzuela. Which means this guy, Ray Burris, has no chance in the media. Got no chance. <laughs> now they go down the Expos lineup, right? They say everybody else's name but mine, and mine is on the screen. They don't even say your name. Don't even say my name. Motivation. Oh, right? was I motivated. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I was so motivated I couldn't even see straight. But that is what gave me that, that determination, okay? Beating Fernando you don't, in game you don't, two. Getting, beating Fernando in game two because that's why they play the game. There's no guarantees in, in sports. So now, after the game, I go out and shut Fernando Valenzuela out three to nothing on a five hitter. Complete game. Come on, come Talk on. to me. <laughs> Fist bump. Boom. Pow. So now, NBC, at that time, they had the media room separate from the clubhouse. So they would come in, the travel secretary would come in, and or the representative media guy would get you and say, Ray, it's your turn to go down. I said, okay. Got dressed, went down, got at the podium. They got my name in the back. Right. And I just sit there and looked at everybody for a little bit because I wanted them to see my name. And then they announced, this is Ray Burris, winning pitcher for tonight's game. I got the microphone. I said, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be here in the playoffs. And I said, second of all, there will be no questions asked tonight, and I'm going to tell you why. Really? And I proceeded to tell them why. They with, named, a, with a scowl on my face, they named and I was still players. agitated, and I gave them the complete rundown of what I heard in my hotel room at the Biltmore Hotel. And I said, world, hear me when I say this. NBC will not be granted any more interviews of me during this rest of this playoff series. And I didn't give them no interview. Walked out, left. Your teammates, your manager had to love your energy. Well, I, I was, I got that from my mom. And I, it, it just, it, I don't understand. Um, the, the media can be so cruel and so un, un, so, it has so much lack of understanding because whether they played the game or not, they don't understand. They sit and watch the game, but they don't see the game. There's a game within the game. Sure. And, to know that Fernando Valenzuela, that was his year, and he was supposed to be unbeatable, you know, just like Sonny listening against Cassius Clay. I mean, sure. you know, that's why they play the game. And so we go back to Montreal with a 1-1 tie. Steve Rogers pitches that Friday night. We win. We go up 2-1. to one. It's the best three out of five series sure. at that time. One best four out of seven. So now our manager... Jim Fanning calls me and Bill Gullickson in. Okay. After that game, he says, uh, "Here's my thoughts. Uh, I'm going to start Gully. I'm going to start you tomorrow. Ray, I'm going to start you on Sunday." I said, "Jim, you forgot about Scott Sanderson. It's an incredible staff you just." I said, said "Scott. I said put Scott Sanderson in there. He helped us get here. He deserves an opportunity." I said, "If Bush comes to sub, you start Gullickson on Sunday. That gives him four days rest. You can put me in the bullpen." Sure. And if and if everything goes well. Then I can start the first game in the World Series against the Yankees. <laughs> Would not listen to it. Gully goes out there Friday, we lose. Now the series is tied. I'm getting scheduled to start that Sunday. And lo and behold, the baseball gods <laughs> shine down on Brother Ray. <laughs> I love you. And we get rained out. <laughs> and I start on Monday. An extra day. An extra day. An extra day. <laughs> <laughs> I got my extra day. So I go eight innings, eight innings against Fernando Valenzuela again. again. <laughs> I love it too. 
dogging him. Dog. Boom, boom, boom. One, one tie after eight innings. Yes. The outcome was tough. The manager also, made, besides making the decision not to pitch Sanderson, the manager uh, also made a decision not to bring in a relief pitcher, which that's their job. Yeah. yeah. And, that, was uh, a, that was a famous Rick Monday home run on a Monday. Yep. We lose two to one. They go on and win the World Series in '81 against the Yankees, and uh, uh, that was history. It, it was. I, I don't know. The taste that that left in my mouth was one of, I can't wait for the winter to be over with. I'm ready to get back at getting over that hump. In '82, because we had the same team going into '82, the same team. And we made a trade in spring training that year. Right. We sent Dave Hosteller and sure. Larry Parrish sure. to the Texas Rangers for okay. Al Oliver. And I'm like, my hopes is just, I'm, I'm sitting there. I'm Al like, oh, Oliver. We got the scoop. He's on the edge of just, that's a Hall of Famer. Yeah, I mean, and all he, does, all he does is goes and, and wins the first batting title in Expos history with 200 and some hits. Unbelievable. And but we just it, we just didn't play good. We did not play good. Even good. even though you had the chemistry, even you had the, the same guys. The same players were there, same talent. You're older. I would have thought that that you case sit was here, in their mind. You sit here years later, no excuses. The no. team just didn't produce. Didn't produce. Didn't produce. You know, a pitcher and catcher, you, you had you had some great ones in, in your time. Obviously, a Hall of Famer, Gary Carter. Uh, with the Yankees earlier, you mentioned Munson. Munson. Um, uh, there's only 24 guys that were teammates of Thurman when when we lost them. You're, you're one of the 24 guys. Um, I was in that, that locker room before you were with the Yankees, and I was actually, I, when I would go near his locker, down the center, in the far left-hand corner, I remember it like it, it was yesterday. Um, I was tentative. Not that he was nasty to me. He was just a gruff individual. He was a natural-born leader in his own way. Um, your your memories of, of, of being his teammate, even though it was a short period of time, it was still your veteran. The greatest makeup competitor I've ever been around. The greatest makeup and got the most out of his ability than anybody I've ever seen, maybe other than people. When, when, when the catcher would talk to the pitcher, you're a veteran. He's a veteran. Mutual respect for each other. Absolutely. What kind of conversations? I mean, what would he say? We talk about hitters. We talk about okay. This is your this is your best pitch. This is how we need to attack this hitter. This is how we're going to beat him. Whether it's down and in or elevated. Right. You know what we call in those days we call stair stepping. Start down, middle, up. Uh, like you're playing tic tac toe. So we would talk about pitchers. Uh, hitters and how we're gonna how we're gonna approach them in old Yankee Stadium with the short porch in right field, and uh, it was just all baseball. I loved it because I'm getting a new perspective from a different individual or individuals. Sure. <clears throat> so it's adding to my game plan of knowledge and information and resources. So I always would talk to my hitters, my teammates who were the hitters and ask them, how would they approach me as a sinker slider guy? Sure. So I'd get that information, I'd put it away in my own think tank. And then I'd go and talk to other hitters uh, on other teams if I thought I was friendly enough to talk to them. Sure. Most of them I didn't talk to them, even if they were my friends. I'd wait till after the game, because that's the way the game was well, played. Yesterday, for you, uh, you know, 150-some, 160-some games a year, yesterday for you was an off day. In New York, when you were this New York Yankee, this guy is getting his pilot's license so that it's a short ride to Ohio in a plane. So you, your memories, like where, where, were you, where were you living with the Yankees so that off day, when you woke up, it's an off day? Well, I was in Hackensack, New Jersey, so I was living. Me and really ran off were out on the Long Island Sound fishing. Really? When we heard it on the radio. So two guys just out relaxing? Having a good time, going? relaxing on an off day, fishing, catching some, uh, uh, some blue, blue, blue fish and just enjoying the nice day, and we heard it. We looked at each other, and it was like, disbelief. And, and the reason he was flying, getting his flying certificate, was to be able to fly home to Canton, Ohio, uh, and be with his family on off days. This game, you become, the wife becomes a single parent in this game. 
because of the demand of time, energy that this game has to have. And it's unfortunate, but that's that's the nature of the beast. There's nothing you can do about it. You the boat docks. You go back to Hackensack with Willie. Back to Hackensack. Uh, Willie was living in Franklin Lakes. Uh, we just we went back home and uh, waited to hear what the uh, what the arrangements were going to be. And they flew the whole team into Canton, Ohio, for the funeral. Really? And you know, the main thing about it, you know, Cincinnati and, and Canton, Ohio, have the worst crosswind. When you come into that airport, okay, and that's what got him. He was coming in, and the crosswinds took him. And we almost—I thought we were going to crash on the plane. Yeah, it's treacherous. I, I hated flying into Cincinnati. It was the worst crosswinds. And sometimes Pittsburgh is like that too. So that service—it's before ESPN. It's before. Uh, yeah. So the team is out there. Yeah. Did you have to leave for a game that? Not, how, how did it? Or did you? It was on. It, it was on a. Um, I think we had to, if I'm not mistaken, I think they canceled the game. Okay. And we made it up later on in the doubleheader. Okay. And I don't know who we were playing at that time, but they canceled the game before the team could go in to the service. The, the one thing I remember um, is is that um, when you guys get back to New York, uh, his closest friend on the team hadn't slept. And uh, that was Bobby Mercer, the outfielder. They basically came up together. And his name also was not in the lineup. Uh, the manager's just respectful, meaning the guy hasn't slept. And the story is Mercer went into the manager's office and, and said, uh, I, need, I need to be in the lineup. And he's the one that got all the hits and RBIs. And uh, in the middle of all that craziness, you guys pull out a W in front of 50,000 fans. Well, that was a moment, you know, where if you're sitting idle, that's the worst thing. After a loved one's lost. I mean, I lost my dad in 83. Uh, I, I was scheduled to pitch the first game of the club and Bill Burton said, hey, if you don't want to pitch, right. I understand. No, no, I got to pitch. I got to keep my mind on it. Like, you know, Do you, you know, know how you did? Go to pieces. You know. Meaning that offset all the emotion. It offset you, all the did emotion. Did you hang in there? Well, you know, I actually went out and won the game. Did and, you really? And, but I, I channeled that energy to the life and times of my dad. And so everything I did, I knew he was right there. So that gave me some stability sure. emotionally. Yeah. Because if I'd been sitting in that dugout, I'd have just went to pieces. I'm telling you right now. It, it just, you know, it, it would have been, because it was unexpected. Uh, now, when my mom passed away, we were expecting that because she had abdominal cancer. So we knew it was time. I remember the stopped, text message. When, we stopped, when she stopped eating, we knew she was ready to go. But sure. she was holding on because she thought we couldn't deal with it. I said, no, Mom, you've given us 86 years of wonderful memories. We, sure. We'll be able to remember this for the rest of our life. Hey, you just don't want you hurt no more. You know, we'll be fine. And when she heard that, her spirit, my spirit, it was just something that just came out of me. Yep. When I had a chance to tell her that, face to face, sitting on her bed, holding her, and she was about as thin as that tripod. Tripod there. Yeah. You, you've been doing this thing a long time. Now your job is to help these young kids. Um, I have all these memories of you. We talked about the Cubs, the Expos, Thurman Munson, Gary Carter, uh, Dawson. Um, I'll let you end the interview. Uh, it's your camera. It's uh, many fans are going to watch it. Uh, go in whatever direction you want. A reflection on how you want to be remembered. Um, a reflection on man, you've been in this game 46 years. I I, I take the lead. Uh, the cameraman will focus on you the way it should have. Well, I think the the one thing for me in, in life is how do we cherish the moment right now? You got. You got ones that live in the past, you got ones that live in the future and hasn't even gotten here yet. How can we take right now, this second, right now, this moment, and cherish this moment? What do we focus on? Do we focus on life? Do we focus on health? Do we focus on a loved one? Do we focus on uh, a cherished memory? Do we focus on something that somebody said to us? Do we focus on a smile, a compliment? What can we take right now and cherish just this moment? And then a minute from now, what can we take that? Or do we take the same thought for the rest of the day? And baseball has given me 
that insight, that mindset, that makeup to understand that there's highs and lows every pitch, every inning, every day, every game. And how can we stabilize the highs and lows? What can we hone in on to say, man, this is nice weather today. I could think about being at the beach. Not that I need to work on a tan, but I can just think about being at the beach with a good old iced tea, sitting, talking to someone and just cherishing the conversation, cherishing what they're saying, cherishing how they say it, and what is it doing to me? Uh, and I think if we did that, life becomes meaningful in every sense of the way. Life becomes uh, uh, more gratifying in every sense of the way. Life becomes a thankfulness for just being alive and existing and being able to be something for somebody or somebody be something for you. And so that's what I've gotten in all these years of living, all these years of baseball, because I've seen ups and downs. I've been a part of ups and downs personally professionally uh, uh, and it's just uh, when you when you allow so many negative things into your heart it changes how you think it changes how you feel and it starts eating away at you on the inside even though you can't see it later on in life you feel it and you wonder how it got there it's because all of the, the the vices that you woke up with starts to creep in and just eat away at you and 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 put you in a position that is not good for your health and I think the greatest thing that we can have and celebrate right now is health. That's the greatest thing. If you can just say, I'm thankful to be alive, I'm thankful that I can stand up and walk on my own two feet, life don't get any better than that. And for me, I'm in it with this. To add to that, the fact that I can eat, eating is a celebration. <laughs> and when I get in that moment and I need to think about something, I think about a good old steak or some ribs or some candied yams with some good old homemade biscuits <laughs> and cornbread, and I'm telling you, life is good. It brings a smile to my heart, a glow to my spirit, and my soul is satisfied just on the thinking of it. Now, when it's in front of me and I'm digesting it, it don't get any better than that, gentlemen. My thanks to you, my brother Ray. Thank Give you, me man. a hug, brother. Love you, man. Before the glory, Ray Burris, that's a class act. Thank you very much.